All right, here's the sixth lecture, re assessing model fit. <coughs> it's important to keep in mind that model fit is completely separate from model um, from the model characteristics. Like the number of the coefficient doesn't tell you anything about how well the coefficient fits the data, unless you standardize it and turn it into R and R squared. And that's what we like about them. Let's look at an example of how this works. We've got from the um, support study. Um, college GPA being predicted by high school GPA. So you can see from our equation up here that predicted college GPA equals 1.81. See, we talked before about how the y-intercept is like way down here. 1.81 plus 0 0.39 times high school GPA. So that's what that looks like, zoomed in on one part of the graph. These are what we call Pearson residuals. Pearson residuals are just simple residuals. Now, I hope you can see that there's a similar pattern here. The pattern here has been slightly rotated. It's as if you turned the the, um, the regression line just perfectly flat and let all the dots kind of shift up or shift down as necessary. So Pearson residuals are just simple residuals, just the number of points in the scale of whatever it is you're talking about, so in this case uh, GPA points, that a line deviates or that a point deviates from the regression line. So this is essentially a representation of the regression line and these dots are either above or below the res regression line a certain distance. We like these plots for at least two reasons. Number one, they give us an idea of how well the, the um, line is fitting the data. So are these dots close to the data or are they far from the data? Now close or far, you have to actually know what's supposed to be close, what's supposed to be far. We can get in a sense of that. This looks pretty close. This is a GPA difference of like 0.1 or something. But this one, that's kind of ridiculous. That's two point something, two point three or something like that. That's half of the entire GPA scale distance from here. So you can see these numbers are numbered according to residuals. Negative ones are um, negative residuals and positive numbers are positive residuals. Now down here it says fitted values. Sometimes it'll say um, just actual values or let's say the name of the variable like high school GPA. Don't be thrown off by this. Fitted val values just means the values on the line, but the values on the line are the same as the values just of the variable itself, of the variable on the x-axis itself, at least for simple regression. So don't worry about that too much. It says fitted, and that's fine. That, these are just the values that could be on the x-axis. And for each of these values, we see how well things fit. Well, the second reason we like these graphs is because they show us if we have skew or if we have equal variance. Like if everything is tight here and then there's a massive spread down here, then we say we might not have equal variance. Or if we see stuff kind of curving in and out or being skewed or something like that, we can have that idea. We can see what's going on in our data. So sometimes we standardize our residuals, so you can kind of see what's going on there on that y-axis. Standardizing our residuals turns them into z-scores, and that's useful for catching outliers and for seeing kind of on average how far things are away from it, everything else. But it's hard to tell how far things are away on average with standardized residuals because everything will adjust to the scale of the residuals to a certain extent. So there, it's best for catching outliers. This outlier has a z-score of, of smaller than negative 4. That's really big. Z-scores of like two or three, well three especially, start to make us wonder about outliers, but negative four, that's kind of ridiculous. So standardization can help us figure that out. Now let's ask ourselves, which of these models is the better fit? The model on data set A, so this is student test scores on the y-axis predicted by GPA on the x-axis, or data set B? There's A, there's B. You probably have an answer by now, and it's probably pretty reasonable. So let's look at data set A. This is the equation. Y hat equals 18x plus 25. In other words, predicted test score is 18 times GPA plus 25. Um, the correlation here is ridiculously high. It's 0.99. These dots lie very nicely along a nice straight line. Now data set B only has a correlation of 0.77. It's noticeably lower. Still a good correlation. But notice that the regression equation is the same. The regression equation is y hat equals 18x plus 25. Same regression equation. How can that be? Well, that can be because model fit and the numbers of the model don't really have much to do with each other. So you can have the same regression equation that fits really well in one situation fit poorly in another situation. So we can't just look at the equation to figure out how good our model is. The equation is our model. And so
you're not going to go ask the new intern if the intern's a good intern, right? Of course, of course she's going to say, heck yes, you should keep me on the job. You ask somebody else. So we have to look at some other information to figure out if the model's good. We can't just look at the model itself. And actually, the R tells us pretty good, pretty clearly. So 0.99 is a much better fitting model than 0.77, as long as it's a linear kind of thing and we haven't screwed that up. So let's take those plots one at a time and look at the residual plots for them. So here's data set A with a really high correlation. Here's the simple residuals. Now, this is kind of confusing. Why is it so big? Well, because graphs just kind of get adjusted to size. But let's remember what that that goes on numbers like four. Well, these this would be numbers like four because it's the y-axis. The y-axis goes from zero to 100. And we're only seeing deviations of like negative four to positive four. That's not very much. So I thought of making the, the graph like this, a really skinny graph, so you can see these residuals are not actually very far from the line. Very small residuals. Now, standardized residuals, that doesn't help us very much because standardization kind of adjusts. Now, you'll notice you don't have negative 4 and positive 4 like we did before, but there's still a good deal of adjustment. So, standardized residuals, I don't usually bother squishing the graph down to remind myself of their smallness because it's hard to tell. You can if you want. I mean, nobody's stopping you. It might help. Um, let's look at data set B. Now, look, the previous residuals, it went from negative 4 to positive 4. So the previous residuals were in here because it's the same scale. That's the way we can compare these is that, that the y variable is the same. So here you have 20 to 30. So that's a 50 point range, whereas before we had an 8 point range right in here, 4 to 4. So that's showing us some good stuff about that. But notice the standardized residuals are still not very big. That's because everything just kind of adjusts. That's what standardization does. So you can't always trust standardization to tell you what you need to know. So let's talk a bit about residuals, just more technically. Our model is not reality. The residual, or error, in y is y minus y hat. And I'll show you visually what that looks like. Generally, as we've seen, models with smaller residuals are better models. They fit the data better. They have better predictions, and they better describe reality. And that also means that they are going to have higher r and r squared values. Now, simple residuals, unstandardized residuals, um, are useful when you're comparing two models that have the same scale. But if not, then it's hard to know what's big and what's small. Sometimes with certain scales, that kind of makes sense. GPA, you know, if there's a residual of two or three, you're like, whoa, the whole range of GPA is only four. So that's a big deal. But sometimes it's hard to tell. So usually we use R and R squared to tell us how well the model fit the data. These are measures of fit. They're measures of correlation, but they're also measures of fit. Same thing. So here's our example that I'm going to use to demonstrate residuals and just the numbers involved. So there's Janice, and her x value is 72, right here. Her y value is 7.4. Well, this fit line says that her y value, if anybody who has an x right here should have a y value, you know, wherever the 72 touches this blue line. So that's her residual. It's a big, big difference. The residual in this case is 5.1 points. It's a lot. That's almost half of the entire range. The whole range is only 6, or sorry, only 12, so 5 is almost half of it. Well, here's Bjorn. I don't know why I was feeling Scandinavian. He has an x value of 117, a very high IQ, but that under predicts his exam performance. So his residual is negative. His y value is 7.5, but it was predicted by the model to be 8.9. So his his um, residual is negative. It's negative 1.4. So correlation coefficients describe association between two variables. They describe the direction, the strength. They are standardized. You can compare any correlation to any other correlation. But for regression analysis, it does the same thing. It describes the association. It describes the direction and the strength. But it does so in natural units, which helps you understand what's going on between the units in a really picky way. Like for every one car extra on the freeway, we expect 0 0.3 hours delay in rush hour or whatever. But those natural units are difficult to compare across studies. However, this does allow us to predict any y from any x value. Sometimes that doesn't make sense, but we do it anyway. 
Correlation coefficients are non-directional. The correlation of x with y is the same as y with x. But the regression coefficients are directional. Well, regression as analysis is directional. y predicted by x is not the same as y predicting x, or x being predicted by y. Those are not the same thing. Now, correlation coefficients, a single number, r, or r squared. The regression analysis, it has a bunch of numbers, but really we only care about two, a and b. They're the different ones. r is a descriptive statistic, and a and b, and then the population a and b, are also descriptive statistics. They describe what's going on in your data. r is standardized, but a and b are not. And you can calculate a p-value for anything. So we calculate a p-value for r. You use a t-test to do that. Not that you need to know that. And that becomes an inferential statistic, the p-value for r. And you can do the same thing. You can cal calculate the p-values for a and b, and those are inferential statistics. Now, it's important to remember, b is just r in disguise. So the p-value for b will be exactly the same as the p-value for r. There's no point in doing both of them. So regression and, co and correlation are two complementary methods. Correlation tells you the strength of a relationship between two variables. It's standardized. You can compare any correlation to any other correlation. Regression is a description of that relationship, kind of in like local valid terms, in natural units, the units that are natural to the thing you're measuring. Prediction in this case is possible. So in this case, so uh, for this example, let's say college GPA and ACT math are correlated at 0.26. I think we might have gone through this already. And here's the regression equation. So the interpretation of that for regression is each one point increase in ACT math score predicts 0.03 higher GPA in college. Okay. It's a small numerical uh, jump, but that doesn't mean it's not important. It could be extremely strong. Of course, it's kind of weakish here, 0.26. And now we see that income is correlated with father's degree. Now, just with the correlation coefficient, all we see is that they're associated, but regression provides more detail. Predicted income is $15,042 plus 15994 times the father's degree. Now, father's degree is just yes, no. Yes, you have a degree. Zero, you don't. So... You multiply 15,994 either by 1 or by 0, depending on whether the person's father has a degree or not. Binary predictors, they get weird. So each step up in the father's college degree, in other words, going from no degree to one degree, predicts $15,994 more in household income. In other words, we predict people whose fathers have degrees to make about $16,000 more in the household than the, fathers, the, the places, the families whose fathers don't have degrees. And here's a confusing one college GPA is correlated with class rank at negative 0.27. What you have to lose is the idea that class rank really matters the way you think it does. Class rank is backwards. So a low rank, 1, means you're at the highest rank, right? We say you have a high ranking when technically the number was a low ranking. So the math doesn't know that 1 is supposed to be good. It just says negative correlation. So there you go. Um, so you can say predicted GPA is 3.341 minus 0 0.073 times the high school class rank. And so you try and interpret this. For every one step up in blah, what do you get? And I think we're all done for today.